Hi everyone, this is Byron Jacobs from DMB Poker and I'm doing another in my series of interviews with our authors to get your meet them a little bit and learn a little bit more about the projects that they've worked on and the ones that they may be working on in the future. And today we have Michael Acevedo here. So Michael, hi, how are you doing? Oh, hey guys. Uh, thank you so much for having me, Byron. And yeah, I'm, I'm doing well. Thanks. And Michael is, um, he's the author of our best-selling book, which is this one, Modern Poker Theory, uh, which has sold so many copies. I, I can't believe that there's any serious poker player that doesn't have this book yet. But if you haven't got this book, this is this is the one that everyone's been buying. It's been up at the top of the Amazon lists for a long time. And Michael is the author of this book. He put his heart and soul into this book. So. <laughs> And and he, he did a great job on it. Now, um, Michael, obviously you're known as the author of this book, but other than that, you're perhaps not as well. I hope you don't want me saying this is not as well known as some of the other players. Can you um, let everyone know a little bit about your background and how you came to poker and stuff like that? Oh, yeah, sure. So um, I started playing uh, professionally online back in 2014. Um, before that, uh, I tried to be professional poker players about three times and I went broke all three times before that. Uh, yeah, that's a pretty crazy story. So last time happened in um, mid-2014. And so uh, back then I had to decide between going back to my day job or um, yeah, and, 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 and quitting poker forever uh, or going back to my mother's house, actually, you know, uh, uh, basically starting from scratch and giving my last uh, shot, you know, to try it out as a uh, poker player, starting from uh, from the micro sex online uh, tournaments. So at the end, I decided to, you know, um, that I, I really love poker and that I really want to, you know, give it another shot. And um, it was also a matter of, you know, pushing myself because uh, I, I always had made the excuse that, you know, I was running bad or was unlucky, but it, it, in reality, it was just... Um, I wasn't putting in the, the work that was required, you know, to be successful in poker. And also I was very uh, irresponsible with my background management and all of that. So um, the last time was in 2014, I decided to give it my all. And yeah, after that, it was, um, of course, a roller coaster. But um, after one year of playing online professionally, I was already playing. Uh, I went from playing $5 and $10 MTTs all the way up to the high, the high stakes playing the 1K MTTs in one year's time frame. Uh, after two years of playing playing online, I was already um, uh, a coach, um, a, the, head co the head coach for the, for the stable that was backing me back then. And I was also, I became a partner as well. Uh, three years after I started playing online poker, I was offered the contract to write a book. I was already crushing high stakes. And five years later, as after I started playing online, uh, the book was already published and I became a, a, a well-known, renowned author. So that's pretty much, you know, the, uh, the short version of the story. Okay. Well, I think there's some lessons there for anyone who's thinking that it must be easy to get going as a professional poker player. I think your, your very honest recollection of what happened to you early on should come as a, a bit of a wake-up call and knowing that, you know, it's 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 not as easy as it might seem to be. Now, obviously, you're you're kind of, having written this this book, Modern Poker Theory, you're very much known as the, the theoretical guy, the numbers guy, the maths guy. But, you know, there's, there's whole other elements to poker, and there are many people who play poker who probably, like, don't know anything about maths or hate maths. Maths even what would you say to people like that i mean do, the, do you think they need to know this stuff nowadays or is it still possible to get by you know players play on instinct and they, they they've got a lot of experience and stuff like that and they kind of read people how, do, how does that all come together for you yeah so you don't necessarily need to master um all of the math in the in the book uh that's not a requirement for you to be successful at poker um the math is there so that you know everything that i explain uh has you know their their respective background and can be you know, confirmed you know with numbers and all of that so the fundamentals of poker are mathematical and so everything makes sense everything is logical and uh, the idea behind studying the GTO or, you know, um, yeah, game theory, uh, which is the topic, the main topic of the book, um, is about understanding the mechanics of the game, right? So once you, you learn the uh, the game of poker heuristics, how, you know, uh, does the game actually work, you can actually, it, it just 
uh, helps you become a better player because you can make better and more educated decisions, which will uh, turn into a um, better expectation or, you know, higher profits in the long run, pretty much. So you really need to memorize a bunch of equations, math and all of that, but um, uh, understand the mechanics of the game is the real purpose of uh, a starting theory so that you just become a better poker player. Okay. Okay. That all makes a lot of sense. Now, one thing that um, um, I think people might be curious about in terms of GTO, you know, obviously uh, GTO, Game Theory Optimal Play, is the, the, the fundamental behind modern poker theory and, and all the solvers that have come into the game in the last five years or whatever. Now, would you say the point of GTO, of learning, well, not learning GTO, but understanding basic principles of gto is so that you can play accurately yourself or is it that you you create kind of like a baseline from which you can then exploit other people when when you realize that they're not conforming to like what should be standard play or is it a bit of both how do you see that yeah actually well um the game of poker no one no, no one should ever really try to to play perfect gto that's actually not the goal again um so always what you should be trying to do is to exploit your opponent's weaknesses right um, but the best way to understand what is or is not a, a leak and how to ex better exploit the leaks is to understand the equilibrium play, right? So, uh, for example, let's say um, you know that at around 40 big blinds, um, the button should be opening around 50% of his hands, right? Uh, if you know that somehow, you know, using a heads up display or just by observation because of some showdowns or whatever, you know that this player is instead opening 80% of his hands. Now, you know, you know, okay, you understand the equilibrium is 50%, so he's far away from that. Now that's that's a good uh, baseline. You understand that he's uh, actually deviating from equilibrium, so this is a leak, right? Now, um, you can attack this leak, and the best way to do it, you know, to, to really know or understand the best way to attack this type of leak is to understand theory yourself, right? So in this situation, for example, you you will know that because it's opening so much, you can do at him very, very wide. And now you will get way more full equity than you're supposed to because now his range is, you know, 80% instead of 50%. So it's going to be way more difficult for him to actually defend all of these, you know, very weak hands against civets. So uh, mechanics like this, once you understand them, they make sense and just help you play better. So you don't need to, um, you know, to play perfectly. You just follow all of the charts, the charts are at baseline, and then... At the same time, you should always uh, try to look for ways in which you can explore your opponents for, you know, higher profits. Oh, OK. And um, when, when I um, I don't do this so much these days, but I've, I've looked at these GTL solvers and played with them. And one thing that, that really struck me and actually really surprised me was I, I kind of had the idea that when I'd look at a solver, it would kind of give me like in chess, it would give me the right move and the wrong move. And I would understand what the right move was. And then uh, but so many times, like one one line, like a call might give you, I don't know, 40.1 percent of the pot and a raise might give you 40.2 percent of the pot. Like they're really, really close. So many of the decisions. Decisions. So, uh, in a sense, I, I kind of got slightly frustrated. I thought, what, what, what's the point trying to sort of understand all this when it doesn't seem to make much? Yeah, it's a tiny, tiny difference at the end of the day. I mean, is that does that happen in like all situations that where GTO is involved, or is it mainly about like you said earlier, trying to understand the baseline so that you can exploit people when they're moving away from the baseline? Yes. So, uh, when you look at uh, a GTO solver solution. Um, for any specific situation, spot, you know, whatever. Um, uh, the thing is that the solver is basically playing against itself, kind of, right? So uh, it assumes that uh, the villain or the opponent in the, in the in the situation, the poker hand, is going to be always playing perfectly against anything you do. And also that your opponent has perfect knowledge of what you are doing, right? So um, when you see these mixing strategies, what the solver basically is doing is protecting itself you know from this perfect player because uh let's say for example um you have a hand let's say king jack or whatever right air and um if you always do the exact same thing with let's say all your king jack for example right so when the flop comes ace queen 10 you will never have the not straight right or when the river fills up with the ace queen 10 you know even fills out the turn or the river whatever when the, the straight gets there if you don't have at least some amount of, you know, knotted combinations of hands in your range, 
you can be uh, very easily attacked by very large bet sizes. So pretty much what the solver does, it just makes sure that by splitting his range, you know, accordingly from the earlier streets in all these situations that are actually very close to him, you will make sure that in the future streets, you are covering, you know, all of your bases. And basically, you just cannot be exploited or attacked, right? But when you play against humans, against, you know, human opponents, they are not going to be, you know, so knowledgeable. And also, they're not going to be capable of exploiting every single possible drawn out in every single line of, you know, betting line structure or anything like that. So um, uh, the best, best thing to do is to try to uh, understand what your opponents are and, and try to, again, try to go against what they're doing. But if you're playing against somebody you, who you think is actually really, really good, right, and who could see through what you're doing, and actually exploit your leaks, your your leaks. You have to be playing protective poker, and that's when you know reverting back to a uh, sort of equilibrium strategy makes more sense because now you're playing with somebody you know is really really good, and if you really unbalance yourself in, in a way that you know uh, it is impossible for you to have certain type of hands in a, any given line or run out. Your opponents are going to go after you very very heavily, and that's when it's important to be playing defensive kind of defensive poker and reverting back to a uh, equilibrium or GTO strategy. But for the most part against maybe 99 or 95 percent of the poker players in the world you have to be trying to always exploit them so that's always your fault i mean obviously you know you have a lot of kind of like gto solutions and stuff in your head because you studied them so much but when you're at the table you're always looking for the exploitative angle rather than trying to make the the most accurate play yourself is that is that a fair summary Yes, absolutely. Exactly. Unless I'm playing against somebody who I know is, again, uh, world class, really, really good, who will be, um, you know, very difficult to exploit himself, right? Because he's going to have most of his bases well covered. And if I try to exploit him very much, the, 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 the thing about exploiting is that it is a double edged sword, right? So when you're exploiting your opponents and going after max value, at the same time, you open up yourself to counter exploitation, right? So when you're playing against somebody who can actually counter exploit you, it is uh it is very, very risky, right? It becomes very risky. But when you're playing against somebody who you know is very unlikely that he will be able to counter exploit what you're doing. And even if he knew what you're doing exactly, he doesn't even know how to counter what you're doing, then you can just go ham against them. Yeah, okay. And when you're I mean you've obviously you know studied studied GTO extensively with using solvers and and uh, creating reports and analyzing situations. Do you get moments at the table where you're like, I don't know, you're like 45 BB deep and you, you open and get called and the flop comes out. But do you immediately think to yourself, oh, I'm supposed to like bet 40% here and check. So, I mean, do you, do you always remember the, the exact, or is it more, do you, do you try to develop a feel for what kind of things happen in what in, in certain situations rather than specifically remembering exact numbers as to, as to what you're supposed to do? Yeah, um, memorizing specific numbers is actually not my strength. Uh, I'm not really good at doing that. What I'm really good at is at um, understanding patterns, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So what happens is that after, because I've seen so many GTO solutions myself and I studied poker so much and all of that, um, you start to develop some sort of intuition, right? And then you look at the board and you know, say, okay, this board should always be like, you know, uh, range bet, small bet size, and you know, things like that, you know, because it's easy. And so many, many things re just repeat themselves. And poker is very interesting in that regard because... It's not that every single spot, even though it might seem like it is unique, it is not. It's actually very, um, uh, it falls a pattern. And it's actually um, the one of the main topics of, uh, you know, modern poker theory, where I went into the, you know, the work of categorizing, you know, boards, flop structures, flop families, you know, flop textures, all of that. Yeah. And once you understand, you know, how certain um, categories of boards, and, you know, in, in different in range situations work in general, then it, it gets very, very easy to know or guess, guesstimate what is the best, you know, equilibrium play there. And they go, then go from there. You could be, for example, looking at a board and you know that uh, the best, um, the equilibrium play, the optimal play is a small bet size, but in range, whatever. But you could be uh, playing against somebody who is a calling station, a player who's not... Uh, like to fall any any decent hand or anything at all and he's just going to call you down so uh against this particular player you shouldn't be bluffing much because you know he's always going to call you pick up your bluff right so you what you do is just 
completely switch your strategy. And now instead of betting my entire range, right, what I'll do is just I'll pick the higher equity bluffs that can improve in future streets. And I will also be betting my made hands. And I will be using a higher bet size, larger bet size, because now I know that I'm gonna, gonna get called. So what I'm try, uh, trying to do is betting high equity hands and trying to get maximum value from this type of player, right? So if I will just, in this situation, going to uh, follow through with my GTO baseline strategy, I will be leaving so much money on the table, right? But against um, this play, if I can exactly, if I can really know, you know, who he is, what are his uh, patterns, and I understand very well the situation, I can very easily just, you know, move very far away from the equilibrium, just in, in the way that I just explained, for example. Okay, yeah. No, when I, when I was... Um... When I was sort of trying to get better at poker myself, I remember that this was probably about 15 years ago now. And a lot of the theory around poker was always like thinking about your opponent's range and trying to make the best kind of play against their range of hands. And now that sort of GTO has come in, I'm, I'm wondering if maybe people are now a bit maybe overly focused on trying to make the most accurate play rather than still concentrating to quite a large degree on what, what their opponent's what their opponent's range is. Do you, do you think that there's something in that? Oh yeah, absolutely. It just it, it happens a lot, right? It even happens to me. It happens to pretty much everyone who studies uh theory. Uh, you know, uh because you've seen so many equilibrium situations, right? And it's the first thing that pop ups into your head. Um, but if you're really uh you know quick enough and you you're really doing your homework, you you always know that you know the best thing is to always try to go for you know for the exploitative play. So um, yeah, but th I see this happening way too much where, you know, even very good players, uh, they fall through with the trap and they see spot and they just out, are uh, autopiloting. So they're playing in the autopilot. And so they see a situation, okay, start check. Oh, sorry, it's more bad or whatever. And then uh, this is very dangerous because again, you're leaving so much money on the table, right? Now, the difference between um, what people used to do back in the day when they will just, you know, follow their, their hunch about any situation is that uh, there was pretty much no uh, real, um, you know, mathematical background or strategy, you know, core strategy to what they were doing, even though, you know, it, nowadays, uh, exploitive play has its base um, on GTO principles, which is the main, the main thing, right? So sometimes you will see people, you know, from back in the day doing some things that are absolutely horrible. And, you know, uh, maybe somehow, you know, they figure, you know, back in the day they work, but nowadays they just don't work because people are not as bad as they used to be. So there is just so much you can get away with if you don't know what you are doing. So for example, when you're trying to go for exploitative play, right, is um, you could think about it like having some boundaries, right? Some juggling play that you have, you can move from, you know, from this to here, but not so much of, or, you know, over the top because then uh, you're just uh, opening up yourself way too much to anyone who is kind of knowledgeable to be counter exploited. And uh, the, the, the most important thing about counter exploitation is that oftentimes the counter exploit could even um, reward the player I mean, even 10, 10x more than the exploit that it plays, right? So for example, I could be exploiting you for 10 big blinds, right? So that's great. But um, if you know what I'm doing and you know how to counter exploit me, you could counter exploit me for 100 big blinds, which is insane, right? That's why it's so dangerous and why many people just, you know, try to revert to the equilibrium strategies. But we are not yet, not even close to a world where most players are so good that everyone has to be playing GTO. That's definitely not the case. It's not going to be anytime soon. Okay. Now, obviously, um, this was your original book, Modern Poker Theory, which kind of um, we were delighted to publish. And uh, like I said, it's our best-selling book, and it took the poker world by storm. Now, obviously, um, you're working on a follow-up book at the moment. Now, can you give people an idea of how that's going to complement the book that you've already published? What What are you looking to? I mean, I actually know, but if you could, uh, for the for the people yeah. who are watching, just explain what the the scope of the new book is going to be. Yeah, for sure. So. Uh, modern poker theory, um, as the name suggests, is a theory book, right? And well, I did my best to to cover up, uh, most of the you know the most important aspects of poker, even though poker is a huge, massive game, and you know many many books could be uh, written, and you know you will never finish writing everything that is to be said about poker, right? But in modern poker theory, I did my best to cover the you know the most important things, the main principles of the game, the main mechanics, all of that, and so. Uh, but it's a very heavy theory book. Right. And so um, many people will like to see more practical examples to actually put in, in practice everything that the book teaches you. And so uh, the next book, which is called the Tournament Workbook, right, is going to be 
um, ma uh, mainly about uh, tournament examples of how to apply the G2 principles that are described in modern poker theory. So if you want to see everything in putting practice, my thought process, how I go about hands, how I go about you know, interpreting the sober output and how to apply that in actual real poker hands, that's what the, the next poker book is going to be about. Yeah. Okay, that's brilliant. It sounds like a, a the excellent way to an excellent way to follow up, and we're hoping and thinking that this is going to do just as well as the first book, and it's going to be something that everyone's going to want. And finally, what uh, I'd like to ask you is uh, just in general the whole concept of of GTO. Is that something that is now kind of done and dusted? We've got these solvers; they know how to do GTO. That's it. End of story. Or is this something that can still evolve somewhere? Can can there be extra nuances and extra sophistication? that can can still be developed from solvers and other software that uses gto yeah so uh we have um we have something very similar that happened in chess right uh that you know chess uh developed you know back in the day back when gary gasparov uh first played against uh deep blue you know he, that was the first time that a human grandmaster or actually the world champion was defeated by a machine by a computer right and so ever since then uh, you know, uh, chess engines have been evolving, becoming stronger, stronger and stronger. It got to a point where now, you know, uh, even the strongest human players cannot beat the weakest chess engines, right? You, even the weakest chess engines are way, are way, way better than any uh, human yeah. player. And so now they, for example, they run world championships of engines and you have engines competing against themselves to see, you know, which one is the strongest one. And so... Uh, the strongest one typically will be used by all of the grandmasters in the world, poker human players, to learn from it, and study from it, right? So similar to that, it's something that's going to be happening in poker. But this is the thing, you know, because um, chess is not really uh, fully solved. You cannot uh, find like the complete perfect um, solution to the game because it's just so massive. Same thing happens with poker, right? So a perfect solution that you know shows people exactly the absolute invincible way to play is not achievable by any means with the computing power that we have right now like maybe hundreds of years or not, i don't know maybe in the future sometime it will be but uh you know maybe with quantum computing something like that when that happens but right now it's just not the case not even close to be solved and so uh gto solutions for example uh from different solvers or whatever are going to be slightly different the output one from another but in general the output is going to be very very similar right it's not going to be so different that you'll be seeing you know a completely opposite direction of results from one to another one some will be you know slightly more accurate depending on the settings depending on how much you know you let it wrong stuff like that and so the main things that you'll see now is changes in stuff like speed you know how fast can you actually compute something and uh with the integration of uh, artificial intelligence in the future right so um you will be able to probably you know just solve faster spots and uh at some point for example there is a, a a very important thing that differentiates tournaments poker from cash games, right? And that is that um, in cash games, your chip value is exactly equal to your dollar value, right? So there is not really too much that can be improved there because any um, any AI, you know, that actually uh, was very powerful and learned how to play the game against itself for a cash game should should get to something, but that is very very close to GTO. Otherwise. Uh, it will be highly exploitable, right? By anyone who has very accurate GTO uh, solver solutions. But in a tournament, um, the dollar value you get from winning a tournament or from you know, cashing a tournament of that is not directly pro pro proportional to your chips because you have to win a tournament depends on how you place. And so uh, there are many models, you know, like uh, independent chip model, ICM, you know, many things like risk premium that I actually explain in, in modern poker theory that help you get a better understanding of tournaments and how to adjust your ranges from pure uh, cheap value to actual dollar value. So you get a better payoff based on how you place in the tournament. Now, at some point in the future, uh, they're gonna be very uh, powerful enough artificial intelligence that will learn how to play poker tournaments and incorporate a lot of these concepts about, you know, placing in higher rank in the tournament and all of that. And so I, my guess is that at some point, we're going to get, you know, completely different, um, you know, and, um 
outputs for that specific for tournaments that are going to be completely different than the GTO outputs just because of the difference between the dollar value to the chip value. Uh, but that's not very close yet. And also, um, you know, all these things have to be verifiable because somebody can come along very quickly and say, like, this is the perfect new new AI for playing tournaments. And it could be completely wrong because it could be that, you know, the strides that is uh, developing are not really so good. So the real the really powerful thing about GTO is that it's verifiable by math. Right, so you always know how far away are you from the actual actual perfect equilibrium. It could be something like uh zero point zero zero three percent of the pot, zero point zero one percent of the pot, zero point zero three percent of the pot. So the number is really low, and if somebody could be able to exploit you um, after you find out the digital solution for a specific spot, uh, it will be for a fraction, minimal fraction of the pot. So that's very very powerful. But with this AI solution, something that you just cannot really know, and you know that's why it's also going to take some time for us to get there. Okay, but one thing I have a I have a background in chess. I'm a, I used to play at an international standard, and the, the thing that really surprised me when I started seeing these more modern AI engines playing chess was how like insanely aggressive they appear to play to a human player. Like we wouldn't, you know, a strong human player would just not think about the, the incredible aggression that they they see. I mean, of course, they don't, you know, an AI or 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 a, or a chess engine won't think of it as aggression. It just calculates the best possible move. But from a human perspective, it, it the play looks extremely aggressive. Would you say that there's anything similar in poker with the, with like the GTO solutions and the AI? Did people, I mean, maybe not so much now, but when these started appearing, did people think, wow, you got to bluff there so big and you know you got to bet and bet and mm -hmm. bet. Was Abs absolutely like yeah absolutely and and actually uh if you look at uh, very closely at the gto solutions you know many times um the the solver seems like a maniac you're like what's going on here because again it just looks so freaking aggressive uh it just shows that you know there is something in in, in aggression and being able to capture your ev or your equity in the pod you know uh, uh and protect and stuff like that that you as us as humans actually uh find difficult uh, difficulty you know developing by ourselves now um something that is very interesting is that it's actually been the opposite when you see the players who have put in the most work into studying GTO solutions, they actually tend to become way more passive in many, in many situations, which is crazy, right? Um, and yeah, I've seen this so many times and it happens so much because um, uh, it, when you, you, it happens, it has to do with what you mentioned before about, you know, the lines being very similar, right? So you are like, okay, I could be racing here, I could be just calling and the AV is very similar. And uh, when you see this so much, it, maybe that's something with your uh, subconscious that uh, I've seen more of the, you know, very GT oriented, you know, top players in the world, they tend to uh, gravitate more towards the passive line in the solver when there is mixing involved. And I, this probably has to do something with psychology. I just cannot tell exactly why that is, but I've seen it time and time again. And it's actually something that I actually myself, even uh, I try to be um, conscious about it and, uh, and be doing constantly the kind of the reminding myself that I need to also be, you know, mixing correctly and also be, you know, taking more and more of the aggressive lines because sometimes it's like, um, sometimes it's, it feels so insane <laughs> to actually take them. It's more, it feels more natural to take the passive line and, and even, especially when the EB is very close, right? Um, but again, there are some people who are actually very naturally aggressive in, in poker, in, especially in tournaments. Uh, you see these players who will show up, you know, with some absolutely crazy bluffs, and they tend to be doing well very consistently. And that is because uh, fighting aggression is very, very difficult. So, uh, so, so again, something that uh, for our brains is difficult to uh, to completely grasp, you know, defending against aggression and also being that aggressive ourselves. And so, uh, specifically for, for tournaments, something I always try to teach my students, you know, if you if you can choose between the passive and the aggressive line, always try to do for the aggressive one because it's going to be easier to play for you. It's also going to be harder for your opponents to react to aggression. Okay. One thought that occurs to me there is maybe there's some psychological element we're trying to manage the variance because obviously yeah. if you if you take the more aggressive line you're you're kind of inviting more variance into your game and maybe players are, are wary of that. Anyway, uh, thank you very much, Michael. That was a great, uh, really interesting discussion. Uh, thank you for all your insights into GTO, and we're looking forward to producing and publishing the workbook, the follow up to Modern Poker Theory. Awesome. Thank okay. you so much. Thank Biden. you very much. Okay. Cheers, Michael. Cheers.